everyone, and so nice to see so many of you today. And thank you, Steve and Marceline, for agreeing to give this talk today. Uh, I'm sure many of you already know Professor Steve Hamesfield. Uh, and, uh, uh, but for those who don't know, Steve is a professor and director of the Body Composition Laboratory at the Pennington Biomedical Research Center of the Louisiana State University System in Baton Rouge. And Steve has considerable experience and vast knowledge in the field of obesity, malnutrition, cachexia, um, and uh, uh, energy expenditure. And Marceline de Cheneau is the manager of the R&D department uh, uh, of the uh, Tecla LLC in Baton Rouge, and has a background in mechanical engineering and in motor behavior and has co-developed the universal 3D analysis software that Steve and Marceline will present today. So the floor is yours. Great, right. thank you. Marceline, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you also for organizing this whole seminar. And I will first give um, Dr. Hemsfield the pearls and he can start uh, by introducing maybe the lab and Dr. Hemsfield. Okay. Great, thanks Marceline. Uh, well, for, for those of you who aren't too familiar with uh, our work, uh, we're in that little red uh, area in the United States map. Uh, we were in Louisiana. And Marceline, if you just press forward, uh, uh, we're, we're uh, at Pennington Biomedical Research Center, which is in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It's the southern part of the state. It's uh, pro probably the largest uh, uh, nutrition research center in the United States. Uh, and it's been around for approximately 30 years. Uh, it's a large center. It's very well equipped with modern technology. And there are a number of uh, investigators there who many of you know. Marceline, go ahead. Uh, let's see. And one more, yeah, so 30 years. And just to begin a little overview, uh, we all know that body shape uh, ha has a strong influence on health. And our current shape indices, we have the apple and the pear, very, very simple human phenotypes that relate to health risks. And the, these simple phenotypes are useful, but they're giving way to something much more complicated as shown in the next slide. Go ahead, Marceline. Well, we know that uh, a person's body shape is really determined by multiple factors, their height, their adiposity, age, race, many genetic factors, diet, activity, hormones, drugs, and so on. And Marceline, if you go ahead and move it one forward, uh, each of us has a specific shape that's not unlike a fingerprint or an ocular scan, a retinal scan. Uh, no two people have the same exact shape. Uh, and so that uh, ability to quantify shape then relates to our body composition. As I'm sure you all know, you can predict body composition from shape. And if you go one more, Marceline, yeah, then uh, of course uh, health risks are related to body composition, uh, athletic performance, energy expenditure, metabolism. So this map then uh, is, uh, the paradigm within which we work. And our goal uh, currently is to develop and implement uh, advanced methods for quantifying shape and through that uh, body composition and health risks. And Marceline is going to now present uh, our efforts to develop technology to quantify these vast number of uh, human phenotype uh, and shapes. Marceline. All right, thank you, Dr. Hemsfield, for the introduction of the lab. And before walking you through all the different technologies that we have developed, I would like to give a quick introduction on 3D scanner itself. There is a large, very large range of different body scanners that exist. And it goes from even, I think now it's even cheaper than $500 that we can find those very small handheld portable device that we have to spin around an object or a body to, to get the body scanned. Then there is some scanner like the one we're using in our lab that require a specific device. And the well-known that we have that we have used are Stream uh, Fit 3D Style 2 or Naked Fitness that is designed for more of a home application that 
I think I was muted for a second, uh, that have a price range between 10 and $20,000. And of course, there is some way more developed technology as well, which are the laser 3D scanners. And there is some, I think the most advanced uh, company in that field is 3DMD. They're doing, um, they're doing some tissue analysis, uh, looking at how the tissues are moving. I know they're doing some studies on breast cancer, et cetera. And we have had the chance to work with a human solution, which is a very precise laser scanner. Um, DG in a dome is a company that is based uh, in Baton Rouge and they're doing application more in uh, video games, for example, they're doing some 4D, so they have a time component also in their uh, 3D scanning. And we can envision a lot of different application with those scanners, but the price tag also goes with what we can do with it. Just to give you a quick uh, view of what are the technology, because all the, those scanners don't work with the same technology. If we look at the small hand portable device, uh, they're all the little dot doesn't mean that we have to have chicken pox to be able to get scanned. <laughs> but actually, um, we need to put before scanning the surface because the scanner will be moving in all the direction. We don't want the scanner to lose its direction and where it is in space. So we have to put some small targets on the body or on the um, object to get scanned so that the scanner can repair uh, can uh, have a spatial 3d spatial configuration and the unique organization of those targets will, uh, will allow actually the scanner to recognize in space where is it so that's about the small scanner then we have side stream fit 3d and naked fitness that work with a technology called structure, structured light technology so pretty much we have a projector that will send a pattern on the object and we have a camera or a different kind of sensors that will actually look at the pattern and the distortion of the pattern and we'll be able to look at by the deformation of the pattern by it will be able to reconstruct then the surface of the object that is being scanned styq technology works with a um, technology called uh, time of flight and that's a very simple technology that we have a sensor that sends a signal and the signal gets reflected on the target and gets back to the sensor and by looking at the time that the signal took to get sent and to get back to the scanner we're able to measure the distance between the scanner and the body and then define the surface of um, of the object that is being scanned lastly we have then the laser scanners that are the most efficient more precise scanner out there they use a laser triangulation technology, meaning that there is a projector that will send a laser beam in a shape of just a line. And we also have a camera that looks like the def that looks at the deformation of this uh, laser beam. And this is very close to the uh, stru stru structured light technology that uh, we discussed before. All right, so how does it work to get from the 3D scan to get um, anthropometric measurements? Usually when a user gets scanned with a 3D scanner, this user has to log in on some kind of app, so it can be a desktop application. And then the data collected by the scanner is sent to a cloud. And then you will actually just receive a report with all the measurements um, from the different scanner. Now, the issue we have with that system is that what's happening in the, in the cloud and all the pro processing that is made on that data is unknown. It's a, Kind of a big black box and we don't know if the body shape will be altered by this um by this um processing or we don't know exactly what is the definition of the anatomical site so where exactly we're getting the measurements on the body and another major issue that is that we will get one report per 3d scan we have no proof that all the system, all the different device actually have the same technique and the same pre-processing. And it's most likely that they don't because they have some proprietary softwares. And if we were sure that over the time, all those reports would not be changed, we could say, okay, that's fine. We can still drive an equation and then um, readapt those measurements to get them to a standard by comparing all the device. But we're not even sure what if those manufacturers actually update the software and have a different kind of processing. We don't want to lose all the data we're collecting right now. So one solution that we have uh, found to avoid those issues with all proprietary software from the 3D companies is to develop our own software. So here, just to illustrate one problem we can have, that's from SS20 device. And this is all the information we're getting about the measurement. That will be the hip measurement and that will be the waist measurement, but that's not 
at all precise enough for clinical application, as you can guess. And as well, if we look at, for example, this measurement here would be the wrist and the wrist out of three scanner, only one scanner gives uh, actually anthropometric measurement for the wrist. So we develop our own software that has as a goal to have exactly the same anatomical definition of the landmarks for all the measurements across all the scanners so that we could process scans from all different scanners and get comparable results. And so the software works pretty much in three steps. First one would be a pre-processing, then we have a landmark detection, and at the end we're calculating and measuring the anthropometric measures. So what data are we getting then if we're not using the reports? So we're actually, um, we have agreed with this company to get the uh, raw scans out of the data, so before they're processed, and those are either OBJ or PLY files. They would look something like that, but actually they're not just a surface. The surface is a mesh that is composed of triangular faces, and this file, this can we, we we cannot really expect what kind of what the file would look like, but it's actually a very easy file where we have the list of all the vertices that are composing the mesh. So each face has three vertices. So we have the coordinate of all the vertices. And we also have a list of all the faces. So we know which vertices are composing each face. This file is actually as simple as this little tool list of um, vertices and faces. Another interesting point is that all the scanners have their own precision. And by precision, I mean the number of points that are in the mesh, number of vertices and number of faces, which is interesting. If we look at HS, here is human solutions so that's a laser scanner. It has only 100,000 points in the mesh. Whereas if we, if we look at the FIT3D, or as we call it also ProScanner scanner, uh, there is 300,000 points in the mesh. And we'll see later on why, what, if that actually has an impact or not. So in an ideal world, the uh, mesh we would get would actually be a watertight mesh. So it, mean, it would mean that there will not be any faces of the machine sticking out. There will not be any patches with missing faces on the body. But it's actually, actually not true. So the first processing step that we had to, to do in this universal software is to reconstruct the mesh and clean it. Sometimes, as you can see here in this picture, we have missing faces. Um, so as you, as you have seen before, it's only a ge geometrical issue. We have triangles, and we, here we're trying to play around with triangles to fill the, the, the holes that are creating on the surface. One step that is critical for that to avoid uh, altering too much the body shape is to fit a polynomial on the, uh, on, the surface, uh, on the surface of the hole that matches actually the orientation of the faces around the hole to make sure that the, the patch we will create will actually follow the curvature of, um, of the body. So, and then we reconstruct layers by layers and you have all the uh, algorithm if you're interested in these papers that um, we have submitted. So how did we evaluate the, um, the, the results of that uh, pre-processing step? So there are some softwares that are doing actually some uh, reconstruction. And one of them is uh, Alias by Autodesk. But this is, we could not use this one at the beginning because this is a very expensive um, license. And we did not have any option for uh, running a batch of scan. And we're, we're, uh, we have a database that have I don't know, four or 500 scans, so we could not afford doing the scans one by one. And we had the same issue with mesh fix. We we're not able to run a, a batch of scan, and uh, also that we had to work with the scans one by one. Um, so uh, we are not able to use the, so the software, but we use them for comparing our results, um, the results of our pre-processing to their results. So the way we've done it, we've uh, taken object and uh, we've have, we have calculated the volume of those objects. Then we have created some holes in the surface of those objects, filled the hole and calculated the volume again. And we wanted to compare the results before and after patching the holes. And all the results were really satisfactory with an R square equal to one. So pretty much that was our validation of this pre-processing step. And on the left here, that's, um, that's hole from real avatars. Um, so real body scans, and those are holes that were pretty challenging to fill. On the B column here, that's our result, then that's alias results, and the last one is uh, mesh fix results. So overall, our results were pretty satisfactory. 
All right, next step was uh, to be able to find the landmarks with the universal software. And one major issue that we had at the beginning is that some people have the thigh touching and the crotch is actually one of the major landmarks that we will use to make all our measurements on the body. So we had to come up with a way of uh, finding the crotch where it actually is versus finding it where the legs are touching. So for doing this um, pre for doing this step, we had to cut the body in slice in uh, in a vertical way. So we cut the body, and then we look at the shape of the cross section of the body. So that would be for the legs. Then we're fitting um, a curve around the um, origin of the legs shape and we calculate what would be the apex of this curve and then we go slide by slice up and when we figure out that the point that we calculated matches with the actual um, actual shape of the body mean that we have reached this point here that would actually be the crotch so we have run some study where we have had some people manually placing the crotch and we made uh, we made calculation to see does our crotch measurements and crotch uh, positioning actually match what a uh, human would position where a human would position the crotch and we had some pretty sat satisfactory results on the top that with fit 3d scanner and the bottom that with ss20 on the left that's uh, our the results of our software and on the right that's the results of the proper hr software of the 3d scanner so overall we have satisfactory results we even have uh, less outliers than the uh, proprietary software and here is um, vision for seeing our most uh, underestimation of the crotch so that was the most distance we have for underestimating the crotch and this one that's the highest uh, overestimation of the crotch height um, so we have talked about the crotch but our other main um, main landmark that we're using for our calculations are the armpits, the tip of the toes and uh, the shoulder. So the shoulder is a straight line from where the armpit is. And once we have found uh, all those um, landmarks here, we're actually able to divide the body in all the different body parts. So the trunk, the arm, legs and the head region. And once we're able to do that, we can actually make the calculation by looking at, for example, circumference. And I get back to my example with a wrist. Wrist would be, for example, the smallest circumference of the arm. And once we have the wrist, we can actually calculate the arm length and calculate the, um, the uh, bicep girth by dividing the arm lengths by four, by example. So that's exactly how we um, define all our digital anthropometric measurements. So here it might be a little scary text here on the right, but it's, it's a definition of how we find each of the um, landmarks and anatomical sites for uh, digital anthropometry. We also, of course, in our clinical trials, we are uh, comparing our digital anthropometry to what is the traditional methods, mean the conventional anthropometry, it's uh, manual tape measurements, pretty much. So we have um, little protocol that we are sure that we have a highly trained staff member that is uh, conducting the, the study and measuring uh, our um, conventional anthropometry. Each measurement has to be taken three times to avoid human error because it's not only putting a tape on someone, the tape can move and also you have to retranscript that number into a, any kind of table and online there is a lot of source of human errors, so we have to reduce at the maximum all these uh, possible human errors. But once this is done, we also have to look at all the data and uh, make sure that we don't have numbers that are out of the range. So we have three measures. If we, for example, we realize that one of the measure is not correct, we'll remove that measure and take the mean of the two remaining measures uh, as the, uh, at the um, measurement for that specific um, body site. So our um, CA uh, methodology comes from uh, this paper here, if, you want, if you're more interested to know exactly the methods behind it. All right, so then uh, we had our software that, uh, and we wanted to evaluate it. So that was our first study. And we we're looking at uh, body circumferences and comparing digital anthropometry to conventional anthropometry. We only have uh, 35 adults that were coming to the labs. And uh, the figure you have on the right here, that's for the waist uh, measurement. I only show one here, but we have more measurements on that paper if uh, you want to look for two further uh, results. So 
we already we didn't have a lot of subject here but we can actually start to see a trend for example pro scanner and ss20 have a higher r square than um styq and we have we can have a sense that styq also like underestimates maybe underestimates a little bit all the uh, all the measurements and you remember styq and pro scanner and ss20 very different scanners styq didn't have any handles for the participant to hold to while the turntable was turning and the scan was being taken. So maybe here we are starting to see the difference between all the different scanners and all the different technologies. All right, and the next study that we have conducted was about the volumes. Um, so we wanted to evaluate, um, you know, how our software is doing on calculating volumes. And for doing so, we had 356 participants coming in that we ran through uh, the 3D optical scanner. DEXA and uh, ADP bot pod measurements. I, did, I won't go through here the details of the algorithm that we use in the universal software for measuring the volumes, but you can definitely find everything in, in the papers that is citing here on, on the right. All right, so for the results, so we have compared first uh, bot pod to DEXA for the total body volume calculation. So for the DEXA, I'll go over after the regional volumes. All right. So what we can see here is, as we have observed for during the first study, there is a little underestimation of the volumes with uh, with TyQ, and we have very good um, um, correlation between DEXA and BotPod, right? And if we look at the SS20 result, there is a very good. Uh, results and very good correlation between SS20 and DEXA and BotPod and SS20. Now, if we go in the different, in the regional, so that's all the different body parts volumes, knowing that for DEXA, we actually estimated the regional volume from the fat mass, the bone mineral content, and the lean soft tissue. All right, so what we have here first, if we look at the head, we can figure that the data is seems to be pretty messy here and that actually can be explained because of the hair we have the participants wearing some swimming caps while they're being scanned to avoid this kind of issue but of course some people have bigger hair volumes than other people and that will show and of course dexa result does not um, is not um, does not include this kind of this kind of um, issues with the hairs that we can have with the body scan so that's for the head then we can see for the legs and arms volume that there is a very high underestimation as much as the volumes are getting bigger. And that's not only for styq device, but that's also for SS20 device. So we have to look about what's looking at what's what's happening here. And for the trunk, for the trunk, for one time, we don't see an underestimation for styq. We even see a little overestimation for larger volumes, and we also see an overestimation for SS20. And that actually can be explained by one of the limitations of our software, which is accurately finding the armpits region. So when we find the armpits at here, instead of finding it here, then the arm volume would be reduced to this region and the rest of the arm would actually be included in the trunk region. So here we can see that the software has some limitation with uh, people that are maybe overweight. Of, we can see that Maybe there is some improvement to do uh, to do here with the uh, armpit detection for volume calculation. If we're looking at the uh, fat mass results, so for the bot pod, we use a Siri equation. So we got the fat mass and fat percentage from the body uh, density. And for the 3D optical scanners, we calculated the fat, the fat mass uh, using supervised learning. So we use a linear regression with threefold cross validation. And we train our model with uh, the body volumes that we calculated from the universal software. And we correlated those measurements with the DEXA fat mass estimations. So we can see that bot pod and DEXA have a very high, uh, have a pretty high correlation and actually have a higher correlation than the 3D optical scanner and DEXA. And that can be explained by the way we trained our model with our volumes. We already had some bias with our volumes. So it makes sense that with the fat mass estimation using the volume calculated by the software, we can also have some bias in, um, in the results. All right, then um, uh, another study we have done is uh, measuring the uh, surface area. And uh, we had a chance for that uh, particular study to include a laser scanner 
a very accurate laser scanner in our in our study. So we pretty much compared all the four different scanners, so size stream, fit 3D, Styq, and Naked Fitness, to the laser scanners that we considered as being our uh, gold standard. All right, so in yellow here, you have the uh, laser scanner results, and we have the mean difference for all the scanner for all the different measurements. As usual, as we can expect, like you have a little underestimation, but very surprisingly, we obtained some very good results with Naked Fitness, which is a cheap as the most inexpensive scanners that um, is designed actually for a home application. So now we can go back to the number, uh, to the precision of the scan that I introduced at the beginning of the presentation, and we can see that actually there is no correlation between the precision of the scan and the results that we're obtaining. If we can see 100,000 faces for uh, the naked fitness scanner and 300,000 uh, for pro scanner, but the one that has the least amount of faces is, has, has actually a better result than, than the uh, fit 3D scanner. All right, so that's a good observation to make that we don't actually need to have super precise scans for, um, for having good results. But actually having precise scan would, actually, would really uh, increase the computation cost of, um, of the scanner. We take roughly 200 seconds per scan to get those results from the universal software with the um, fit 3D scan. So that has a high number of faces and vertices. And we take only 0.2 seconds with the one that has only 5,000 faces. So that's also something to consider. If we want to run a really high, a very la large batch of scans, we rather have some scans that have a lower number of faces, and we don't want our laptop for to run for a few days in a row. All right, another study we have done is uh, with young children. So we had, uh, we had children coming between five and eight years old. And all right, so for the scan that we could run with a universal software, we had uh, significant uh, interesting results, but there is something more interesting that we can get out of this study is for example, with a StyQ device, we were able to use 0% of the scan of the five years old because of the scan quality. Right, so those are in for feed 3D, it was only 38.5%. And this is a reason why kids are moving during the scan. They're not able to stay still for a few seconds. And we can see those kinds are all the ones that we have to manually remove from our uh, database and that are <laughs> no way usable for, for the studies. So 3D scanners, they're good maybe for adults and we need to see the different technologies better when people have handles to hand to to get um, to stay still with than just a turntable and um, that will um, uh, increase the movement for, for the participant during the scan. And so we had this, this result with the kids, but also actually with the adults. And that's something that I did not really mention before, but even for the adults, we have some issues with the scan. Sometimes the um, limbs are cut off and that's mostly with the extremities. All right, another study we have done is about principal component analysis. So uh, traditional conventional anthropometry cannot really fully capture the body shape. So we, can, we cannot, exactly drive result for from the, for the health from uh, conventional anthropometry so we're thinking okay maybe from the 3d scan then we can do it and we can use the principal component analysis to tell us where can we find the most information in all those faces and all those vertices of the 3d body scan and the previous studies that has been done um, actually approach for predicting body composition. So it's um, cholesterol, triglyceride, glucose, and health risks. Um, so we actually saw an improvement in the prediction of serum lipid, diabetes markers, and function and strength measurements from using PCA and 3D body scans. Um, one major issue that we had with this, pre this uh, previous work is that um, there is a landmark detection that has to be done uh, for the PCA. And in these previous studies, they have done that manually. So I mean that someone on the, hand, on the almost 200 participants had to place 75 markers by hand. So that's a huge 
uh, huge work to do, very time consuming. So we wanted to try to automate this process. So we had an automated uh, landmark detection with 38 markers that you can see here in the bodies are very small, but um, that's uh, what you can see the little dots in color. The next step of the uh, principal component analysis is actually match the original scan to a registered um, mesh because we need to know exactly the register mesh um, goal is for the user to know exactly where are each vertices we know that this vertex number 356 is exactly on the shoulder we need to know where the mesh is on the body so we we can see that this template here is actually changing to merge and to look like the scans that we originally took. That's pretty much an optimization technique. There is a cost function. We want to reduce some different errors and I won't get into details there. We use a technique for this um, mesh fitting uh, cited in this paper here. And the register mesh has uh, uh, 60,000 uh, vertices. All right, next step is actually performing the principal component analysis. So we want to know uh, what principal component have the most body composition information in them. So at first we have a regression that is 60,000 points on the body times three, um, three coordinates, it's 180,000 components. And we're able, here's a, the, the, result, the results that we're presenting, it's only for the first 30 components that are the more meaningful. But if we're looking at the heat map here, we realize that actually within the 10 first components, there is most of the information about, uh, about the body that we can find here. So we don't actually need to have 180,000 components to be able to correctly estimate the body composition. But here, those principal components not only show information about body composition, but they also show com information about the body pose. And we want to stay away from those, and we really want to know which of those components, maybe the 10 first here, are really for the uh, body composition, not the body pose. So we're doing some machine learning and some linear regression to be able to um, link the fat mass and the lean mass to these uh, principal components. And those are the uh, the results that we're getting, the accuracy results that we're getting for, for those um, body composition prediction. On the left column, you have automated um, pipeline. That's the one that I've just presented to you. And on the right side, we have the manual uh, pipeline that have been presented in the previous paper. So those results from manual um, composition are a little bit higher. But those, uh, there is no significant difference. Uh, there is no significant. Oh, there is no uh, difference. Uh, oh, <laughs> you got it. Between between those two measurements, right? So it means that automated or manual actually both work. Another um, result that we got from here is uh, if we accumulate the most meaningful uh, principal components, we want to see how many of them do we need to actually estimate, uh, correctly estimate the body composition. So that's our, we have the testing, uh, testing data set for our um, linear regression and the um, training data set for um, the linear regression. And it's important also to know that um, if PCA, the, the first principal component that has the most information for one scan would not be the same one for a different scan. Really all the PCs and all the most, um, the PCs that have the most information in them are different for all the scans. So here we added the most influential PCs for, uh, for all the scans, right? And we can see that uh, within pretty much 30 PCs, we can actually get most of the information for all the prediction that uh, we tried out here, lean mass and fat mass for male and female. So if we go back to the point of the study, does it worth it to uh, spend so much time putting some manual landmarks and you know spending so much time on that versus doing, um, doing an automated process of landmark detection? We don't have significant difference between the two. So it's, it's a good sign for the automated process. 
All right, and I know some of you were interested about knowing how those new technologies and how can we use those apps that allow us to do some uh, 3D scanning. So I did not introduce it at the first slide with the other scanners because the technology is a little bit different. So we have seen uh, in the PCA analysis the uh, process of uh, template matching, and that's exactly what those apps are doing. And we call it generate 2D to 3D because the apps, the software is able to turn a 2D image into a 3D scan. And how does it do that? Usually there are multiple techniques, but usually there is, um, we can understand, their software can understand where is the silhouette of that person and also can place some major landmarks on the body. And with those two information, uh, the company usually has a lot of different scans and are able and have a good visualization of all the body shapes. So they will match a template to actually the pictures that have been taken. And, um, in exclusivity for you, we have done a little bit, uh, a little um, analysis of um, those, the results of studying these apps. And we have run uh, those avatars through the universal software that we have developed. And we compare it to the results given by the proprietary software of um, those um, 3D app scanners. Uh, in blue, that uh, their results in uh, orange here, that's um, our results. So we can see that we have very satisfactory results and we don't know exactly why, but they had an issue with estimating the, their uh, arm, arm girth, but that's only with three or four subjects and there is way more to come with those apps, but that's a very encouraging result uh, to start with. Um, we are about to start um, clinical study at a um, uh, commercial weight loss center. So we've had the chance with Dr. Hemsfield to participate into the NSF i program. I don't know, I'm sure some of you are familiar with it. And the goal is really to transfer technology from the lab to the industry. So we wanted to evaluate where actually 3D scanning could fit into the health and wellness markets. And we arrived there thinking that maybe it could fit into some kind of corporate wellness and engage the employees of, uh, of companies maybe to, to participate in the wellness program, et cetera. But what we didn't realize is that 3D scanner uh, requires wearing some spandex uh, bra for, for the woman and shorts for, for the men. We, have, we need to have some uh, tight fitting clothing. And that's a big issue because no one would actually wear that in a workplace and no one feel comfortable for that. But what we actually figured out is that those devices may have their place in uh, weight loss centers because uh, we've talked with director of weight loss centers and they told us that they have actually issues with uh, patient retention and patient motivation staying engaged in their program. So we're thinking, okay, we can do a behavioral study and seeing whether including a 3D scan into the patient routine might motivate them to stay engaged more in the, in the program if they see really the pro progression of the program on their body shape. So we all study this for 60 patients over a six month program and we'll do a 3D scanner once a month. They, they will be able to um, evaluate their, to, to see their body scan through an app. So we are actually starting this study in July. So I don't have any pre preliminary data to show you, but I think this is very exciting for introduction of 3D scanner into uh, medical settings. And the uh, last part I wanted to talk to you about is that going through this um, i -Corp program, we realized we learned a little bit about interoperability and we actually realized that it was what we were uh, treating with their universal software. And uh, with Sima that, um, that I have been, and I and Dr. Hemsfield have been working with, she was a postdoc at Pennington Biomedical Research Center. We imagine that that it would be a great idea actually to have some kind of cloud, participative cloud where different research group could actually um, put their data and merge their data together. And we have created such a platform and to make sure that all the data is safe, we actually have integrated some built-in uh, built analysis tool with quantile regression and with different kind of prediction models. And um, we think that actually this could really help with, I go back to my previous slide, but some of you may be familiar with all these equations for calculating surface area. 
and um, all of them are very specific to one to one uh, one group of population with a certain age with a certain BMI. And we're thinking that if we have this project where we can actually, when we need it, drive equation for the very specific group that we need, it would be a very powerful tool. And with the uh, collaboration of uh, research group all around the world, we can actually have the largest database. And with a large database, we're actually able to have the most uh, updated models all the time. So we have this project. If you have any questions about it, um, feel free to contact us. But right now, we are really uh, looking for some people who would we would be willing to try it, uh, try it with us and uh, maybe share some data with us so, with us so that we really can uh, so that we can, everyone can benefit for uh, such an application. All right, so thank you very much. Here are uh, Stephen's uh, email and my address, uh, email address if you have more questions, but I think that we have a little bit of time now for, for some questions. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you for uh, that very interesting talk. Um, before I actually open the, f uh, the I, yeah, I open the floor to questions, I, do have a couple of queries, a couple of comments as well. Um, so, you, so some of those devices actually produce very detailed images. And I wonder whether uh, you could comment on possible ethical or privacy issues that you might have encountered or um, research group could encounter, um, especially if those images are stored on uh, um, smartphones or uh, um, this type of devices? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. So obviously for our research, we have to be HIPAA compliant and we have uh, multiple ways of doing so. Uh, the first way would be now that we're able to divide all the uh, body parts, we can actually remove the head of the person and place a template head of um, on the head of that person. That's one way of doing it. The other way is uh, we are always using uh, participant a ID. So whenever they have to log in on an online profile, they have an ID and they don't have uh, their name. That's more for privacy and HIPAA regulation. But of course, this technology is going to get more and more involved and more and more precise. And we can think about ethical, ethical problems, right? Um, Sure, it could have some ethical problems, but it would be exactly the same than any other technology that are already existing today. And I'm thinking about facial recognition and those kind of um, those other very advanced technologies. So to my point of view, there is nothing more that we could get out of 3D scanner that we cannot already get with uh, some other some other technology. Sure. Could I, I add just a little note to that, Marceline? Uh, sure. The question sparked another thought of mine, which is uh, there's now software being developed that can uh, you can scan someone in full clothing and remove the clothing digitally, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Uh, now that 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 of course wouldn't you know give a true rendition of the person's features, but it might enable us to not have to wear spandex and other things like that. And mm -hmm. you could just come in in street clothing and it'll remove the clothing digitally. And from that uh, avatar, it's like going to be a naked avatar, basically, you could make the measurements. We still don't know if that's actually going to work, but uh, people are well along in developing technology like that. Mm -hmm. And it could actually really open up the field. So as we have seen before, one of the major issues right now to incorporate 3D scanner in settings is that people have to change and people are not comfortable to do so. So if we're able to have this kind of um, software that would, you know, strip um, strip the person, it's not really well said, but <laughs> remo remove the clothes of the person, uh, we can it can open up to a lot of different uh, different application in a lot of different settings. Because I would imagine that clothing is one of the biggest errors. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, also, we had uh, actually a question before uh, the webinar started from uh, someone working on uh, uh, the fetal outcome spectrum disorders prevalence study in Manchester, Salford. And uh, um, this person is interested to know if these techniques have the potential to screen for dys uh, dysphoria. 
uh, related to prenatal alcohol exposure or and chromosomal anomalies such as microduplications. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think that there are already some uh, papers that have been published on uh, screening genetic abnormalities in in kids and maybe in young in young kids. Um, I mean, right. Today, with the presentation I gave, we have gone as far as fat mass estimation and for uh, some health risk factor estimation and prediction. I think the key to all of that, we don't know where the technology would be in five or 10 years from now. It's evolving very, very quickly. The key to all of those answers would be longitudinal study and when we'll actually be able to conduct some study on young infants and on on toddlers and on all the different population, we can then drive any kind of models and machine learning we want. Uh, right now, we still have some challenges with uh, scanning kids, as we have seen, because they're moving, because the technology is not is not designed for them. And we actually just received another NIH uh, grant, right, Dr. Hemsfield, called Shape yeah. Up for Kids, and that's really our goal to study kids' population. And really, I would answer that question that data is key. And once we'll be able to do longitudinal, longitudinal study and gather a lot of data, may, why not? It's maybe yeah. 20, 20, 30, a specific question, but it will op obviously open up a lot of different opportunities. Sure. And there's quite a few questions in the chat. So, and I think this one is related to what you were saying as well, uh, in terms of applications actually in pregnancy. So have you done any work on assessment of body decomposition in pregnancy? In some ways, it feels like pregnancy is the final front frontier for body composition assessment, as many standard techniques such as DEXA or MRI are not suitable for regular and repeated use in pregnancy. And this is from Claire. Uh, Meek, um, mm -hmm. Steve, you met Claire at the anthropometry yes. webinar. Yes. I don't know whether you want to. Yeah, I, I could say a, a few words, Marceline. Uh, ba uh, we are doing a uh, collaboration with uh, a scientist in uh, Texas, uh, longitudinal study of pregnant women. And Marceline, you can help me here, but uh, the problem is all these landmarks will change, right? So. Uh, to generate accurate measurements in pregnancy will, will be somewhat challenging, but uh, totally feasible. What do you think, Marceline? I think that it definitely can be feasible. Um, yeah. Not with our, we, not with the way our universal software design is designed no. right now, because as I explained, everything is very geometric. So it's the highest point here, the highest point there, and of course, the body shape will be changing. The, the general body shape will be changing with pregnancy. But I don't see any issue with trying to replicate some kind of software for analyzing uh, the change in body shape with a pregnancy. But it's not something that we can carry right now with our tools. Yeah. But I'm sure but, there's a research group doing some already doing some work on pregnancy and 3D scans. Yeah, which really would be wonderful because it's totally safe, non-invasive, yes. inexpensive, all of those things. Um, a question from Ken Kanong. Uh, in obesity research, do you see the 3D as an option to DEXA or we could add to DEXA um, understanding disease risks? So we are hoping that we'll get there. And um, again, that the more that I will have and the more um, the, the most accurate will be our prediction, but that's where we want to get. And that's because 3D scanning technology doesn't require someone highly skilled to perform it. It's far as being as expensive as DEXA and it's non-invasive. So that's really one of the goal of doing all this work is to be able to correctly predict uh, body composition as good as DEXA, but with the, um, with the 3D body scan. I, c I could answer, add a little to that. Uh, Marceline didn't present some of the work that's ongoing and yet unpublished, but uh, you can use a technique called manifold regression. I hope I had that right, Marceline, uh, to uh, do a 3D optical scan and then uh, generate a DEXA image from that. And it's done by uh, regression technique. It's not the true DEXA image, but it's uh, really close. I, uh, the ones that uh, generated by my colleague, uh, John Shepard at the University of Hawaii, 
they mm -hmm. they match almost perfectly in actual DEXA. So I, I I'm sure that's coming. And you can do the same thing with an MRI scan. We we call it a pseudo DEXA because it's not a real one, but that gives you a sense that you know a few years down the line, I am certain we're going to get uh, much better at generating what might be a DEXA mm -hmm. scan. Mm -hmm. And from Laura Watson, are you combining these measures with other clinical measures that could potentially phenotype body shape with disease or disease risk? So that's a very interesting question because that's also something that uh, we are looking forward being able to do with the platform I presented at the end. So uh, the way that would work is that we won't limit the variable to body composition or metabolism, but we also have all the demographic and we'll have a lot of different data, data here. And uh, whenever we want to generate a report and use some machine learning and prediction models to do so, uh, we can actually select all the dependent and independent variable that we want to use to drive those models. And there's really no limitation and it can be open to um, any different research topic, any different research uh, population groups, and that's definitely something that we want to uh, we want to look into. Yeah, uh, you know, a little more on that end. Uh, there's an infinite number of uh, human phenotypes, uh, but to, just to give one example of what might be coming, uh, as people age, you can easily tell an old person from a young person just by looking at them, right? Uh, and that's because uh, they uh, shape changes. Sometimes people stoop over a little bit, uh, fat moves centrally. There's a major change in shape as you age. Well, it might be or will be possible to quantify those uh, changes in shape as people age or even generate what might be uh, biological age as opposed to a chronological age, things like that. And also uh, there are things like kyphosis and scoliosis that are now being quantified by these technologies. So I think you're going to see so much more of that uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. And I think also some, something we could add here, we have not done that many study with uh, very old people. And right. I'm wondering just at the top of my head, maybe we we'll also have see some kind of limitation that we're seeing with baby, with people that have some trouble really standing and that cannot right. maintain this A pose. So maybe that's where also those more expensive laser 4D scanners can uh, come in the game. If the person can just walk through and we can capture just the exact frame, that the person have that we can run the universal software on it. Um, that we also need to explore that technology for other people for sure. Right. Yeah. And a question from Alison Slay. Uh, you mentioned about possible movement artifacts. How long does the scan take? Is it possible to measure in a different position, less likely to move, for mm -hmm. instance, lying down? Mm -hmm. Um, the scans with these, uh, with the SS20, SciQ, um, and the, the four of them, it takes around between three and five seconds, I would say, for most of them. So it's pretty quick. But when the person doesn't have handles or anything to 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 attach to, there is more. Uh, they're more prone to actually move. And uh, with those one, we don't have the choice of the position. It has to be in an APOS. That's how the scanner is designed. But with more expensive, with the uh, laser scanners, actually, there's multiple poses that are allowed. And of course, the one that are doing 4D, you can do any kind of body movement that, um, that you desire. And that could also, also have some very good application in biomechanics studies. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and then a last question, I think, here. Uh, do you have any idea whether we have MS can based body composition data on Asians and or Indians? Um, I don't know whether that is. Kavitha, are you still online? Sorry. We're not seeing. What's she? We're, we haven't seen any publications or many publications yet out of uh, those regions, but I'm certain they'll, they'll be coming fairly soon.
That's part of our, our idea for the uh, cloud project. For the cloud project, all yeah. All of those uh, scans and <laughs> okay. get great phenotypes. Yes, yes. And another question from Laura. Um, you mentioned that the 3D scans can replicate DEXA. Can DEXA scans be turned into 3D scans? You may have that, covered this that, and I missed it. Uh, <laughs> that is a great question, yeah. right? Because DEXA is truly a 2D method. And the answer has to be yes, but uh, I have to think about how you would do that. But uh, sure, yes, absolutely, yeah. I see we can send you a lot of, the, of DEXA scans and yeah. both we love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we left our email at the end of the presentation and uh, <laughs> if there is any kind of work that you want to share and uh, we'll be there to answer any questions or to start maybe some collab collaboration or some work. Any other questions from the audience? No? No? Great, and we're actually finished on time, 4.30. Okay. <laughs> so I just wanted to say thank you very much again for um, giving the talk today. And uh, and I just want to say again, thank you for to Steve who, um, you know, I met at the anthropometry webinar and uh, uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that again next year. So um, yeah, so thanks Terrific. again. Thank for uh, for giving this excellent talk so and yes lots of people are saying thank you as well on uh, on the chat so thanks for um, this I will be discussion. I will be in touch soon anyway so <laughs> to, terrific Emma yeah. okay thank, thank thanks a lot for uh, okay. doing this today thank you bye and bye. Thank, thank you to you everyone care. who um, came today as well thank you bye bye <laughs> thank you bye bye.